and good evening and welcome to the Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy's 2020 Cohort Group Action Project, Leadership in a Time of Crisis, Proposing a Preparedness Model for Erie County. Specifically, the 2020 Cohort has developed a four-part speaker series focused on small businesses, nonprofits, and the community. Tonight, we'll be presenting the fourth and final session in the Erie County Business Series, Small Business Resiliency Toolkit, Preparedness Plans, and Human Resources. Our first speaker this evening, Gary Sullivan, will walk attendees through the importance of creating and maintaining a business preparedness plan, provide some resources for creating a business preparedness plan, and then offering interactive Q&A. Rachel Strakovniak will lead the second half of our session and focus on some common human resource issues faced during the pandemic, as well as general HR preparedness for small business owners. Both of our speakers have 15 to 20 minutes of prepared content. And while some of the content may be interactive, there will be a dedicated five to 10 minutes of Q&A available for each speaker immediately following their presentation. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the chat feature so our moderators can bring these questions to our attention. Please note tonight's session is being recorded for future consumption. And at the end of this session, a slide will be shown with a link to a short survey uh, where you can find and fill out to let us know how we did. It will also be posted in the Facebook chat. The 2020 cohort hopes the content of this session has been helpful and we do appreciate your honest feedback and suggestions. So diving right in, our first speaker speaking on the topic of business preparedness plans is Gary Sullivan. Gary is currently an assistant professor at Mercerus University and serves as the program director of the F.W. Hurt Erie Insurance Risk Management Program. Gary is responsible for developing the school's new risk management curriculum for the Walker College of Business in collaboration with the Ridge College of Intelligence Studies and Applied Sciences. Gary holds degrees from Lakeland College, the University of Illinois, and the University of Pittsburgh, as well as several industry, industry designations, including the Chartered Property Casualty Underwriter. No further ado, Gary, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Bear with me a moment. I'm going to pull up my presentation here and good evening. I am pleased to present the information on the business continuity planning, not so much from an academic perspective as it is from a business perspective. In a previous role, I was with Erie Insurance 15 years and another insurance carrier for eight. And I was part of the business continuity planning and response uh, teams for the claims division. So I have some experience on a large scale, and I understand the audience members are probably on a smaller scale business. And the point is that no business is too small to do some business continuity planning. The reasons? Well, we have some recent headlines uh, over the last few years from, uh, from the area. In the uh, third quarter and end of uh, third quarter and part of the fourth quarter, we had Mill Creek Township, uh, their system was hacked by a ransomware uh, group. In 2019, Pittsburgh Avenue was closed for, for a water main break. Several blocks were affected. There was an electrical, electrical issue in downtown Erie in which the uh, a six square block or two businesses were shut down for a time. And there was another electrical issue that occurred um, several, uh, a few years earlier and several blocks were affected. And then in um, 2016, Fred's Beds was the victim of an arson fire and the uh, perpetrator was sentenced to a uh, 10 year prison sentence uh, in 20, at the end of uh, 2019. All of these issues affected small businesses in Erie uh, as a result of the incidents. So what is business continuity management? And it's a planning process. So you align your continuity management with risk management. So when problems arise, it will mean spending some money to fix. The goal of business continuity planning is to predict as much as possible what problems may arise and look to have solutions at the ready when they do. Uh, there's an organization called the Institutes, that's where I have my designations, and they have a program on risk management in case anyone's interested. And then there are several formal frameworks that are available to develop your own uh, business continuity and risk management approach. So the first step is to plan. Understand the business, know what you do, 
and how you do it. The next step would be conduct an, a business impact analysis. This is where you're looking at workflows, uh, you under, understand your processes. Then you perform a risk assessment. You describe the risks, you list them. Uh, do you have risks with your vendors? Uh, do you have uh, them, is there a failure to follow uh, privacy laws that you're interacting with them and sharing data? Or they can't meet your supply requirements? Those are some risks that might be considered. Then you develop a continuity plan, how to address the risks and how to remain operating. And then implementing the plan means having it at the ready. So one of the first things uh, to do is conduct a uh, business impact analysis. And here's a sample worksheet. And so I'll go through each one of these uh, three general areas to give you some background and input on what they all could mean for your business. For timing, this is the point in time when an interruption would have its greatest impact. Would it be a peak season uh, at the end of the month or end of the quarter when it's important to have um, sales and, and profits wrapped up for bookkeeping purposes? On the duration, is the interruption, could it occur for an hour? Would it be uh, impactful to your operation? What if it occurred up to eight hours? Or how about over the course of one to three days? or you're shut down for a week or a month. We'll go back to the example of Fred's beds uh, when they suffered their fire. Uh, I believe, and um, if anyone's on the call who knows, I believe they were um, unable to resume operations for several weeks due to the investigation that was taking place due to the fact that it was a set fire. The next column is operational impacts. Um, could you have lost sales or income? Would negative cash flow from delayed sales uh, occur? Would in expenses increase either through overtime, outsourcing, or expediting costs to replenish your supplies? Would you uh, be incurring regulatory fines? Could you uh, incur contractual penalties or lose contractual bonuses should your operation be interrupted? Would customers be dissatisfied? Or could there be a delay in uh, executing your business plan or strategy? And then on the last column, you're quantifying your operational impacts in financial terms. So this is a business impact analysis worksheet that could be used to assist in doing some planning. Then you look at the management process. So you're gonna scope, process, and plan. Scope, what is covered by your plan? What does it address? And at what point do you activate your business continuity plan? For process, assess how it impacts your vendors, your customers, as well as communication. How does it impact your accounting functions? Is there uh, some legal requirements that are in play? How does it impact your facility? Then from a planning process, making lists and checklists are very important. One of the things that, uh, that I was responsible for at Erie Insurance was the uh, drone program. We were one of the first insurance companies to fly drones on, on claims. And we uh, went through a risk assessment process and determined that we needed a checklist for pre-flight, in-flight, and post-flight operations. The checklist was very brief, but it still was a an excellent exercise to make sure there was a consistent approach to flying anytime that we needed to. So here are the <clears throat> uh, steps involved. First in developing that business impact analysis, there are some steps in, uh, in place where you develop a questionnaire, you conduct a workshop, um, you receive uh, business impact analysis questionnaire forms if you're dealing with multiple uh, locations of your operations. Uh, interview employees and management to figure out where you have some gaps. Then you, then you develop your recovery strategy. Should something happen, how are we going to re respond? Then you develop your plan and, and list out how are you going to address an interruption, whether it be for a day, three days, a week, or a month. And then you test and you uh, conduct exercises 
to go through the uh, next phase, which is the planning uh, development. So your plan would consist of a program administration, your business continuity organization, who's all involved, your business impact analysis, business continuity strategies and requirements. What are some manual workarounds within your work processes should you be shut down for a small period of time? Uh, incident management, how are you going to respond to certain things that occur? Then you train, test, and conduct exercises to poke holes in your plan and improve it. And then you maintain it and improve it over time. Some testing scenarios may include some of the things we talked about already. What happens if you have physical damage to your building? If you are a small business in a triple net lease situation or, or the building owner, you should have at the ready several different contacts to assist you with uh, shoring up your business should um, you have a, a fire or windows broken out or a, a, a vehicle runs into your building. Also, uh, if machinery breaks down, making sure you have a list of vendors to call to help with the repair process. Restricted site access. This is a big um, part of the COVID world. What happens if you have restricted site access? How are you going to be able to maintain your operations? What happens if you have supply chain interruptions? Do you have multiple suppliers you've done business with in the past that you could call upon to help fill the void, so to speak? What happens if you have a utility outage? Uh, in a previous role, and I, um, I used to live in South Bend, Indiana, in a previous role, I ran a claims operation for a different insurance company. We had a, uh, an ice storm that knocked the power out for over three days in our county. The whole county was knocked out for three days. So a lot of businesses were impacted. What happens when that occurs? How do you respond? What would uh, happen if you have a cyber incident? Do you have uh, back, backups in place for your systems? Do you have data stored off-site? How are you protecting that information? And how would you deal with the absenteeism of essential employees? These are all things to consider in the components of a business continuity plan. And uh, to segue into the next speaker's uh, presentation just a bit, I wanna talk about a personal experience that has occurred with a member of the family. Uh, my uh, daughter-in-law and her husband own a small business in the Pittsburgh area, and they uh, were able to remain open after they put uh, protective measures in place. Uh, but they're a small business. They have uh, three employees plus themselves running two retail uh, operations in um, eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh. They did not have a, they did not have a um, uh, plan in place for dealing with COVID absenteeism. They had a, an employee manual, they had um, a continuity plan in place, but they had an employee who wanted to go on a two week vacation out of state this past summer. Well, the problem there is with a two week vacation out of state, the uh, state of Pennsylvania's health department had put out guidance that said uh, those employees, that employee would have to quarantine for two weeks upon return. Well, that's a four week absence and the uh, <laughs> the husband wanted to uh, let the employee go. However, because the information was not in their, their manual, they, they just tweaked the manual and allowed the employee to take, take the two weeks of vacation. The point is that um, no business is too small to do some policies, uh, do some planning. Business continuity planning is extremely important because any, any uh, incident can occur to any size business. So with that, um, if you have any questions or would like some assistance, uh, my email address is on the screen. I also have my cell phone uh, on the screen as well. I'm happy to uh, discuss, um, I'm happy to take questions tonight, but also happy to discuss specific questions offline if anyone is interested. So with that, um, Jeff, why don't I turn it back over to you? Sure. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Nice job. Uh, so we had one question roll in, um, and I, I actually do have a question. Uh, we, uh, so the question here um, from our moderators, you know, consumers are always advised to keep three months of savings tucked away for emergencies. Are there any similar recommendations for small businesses? Yeah, the small businesses should probably look to double that, um, Kat, but you can also um, talk to your lending uh, your lender, local lenders to see if you can open up a 
uh, credit facility where it's available in an emergency should you need it. The other thing to make sure you have in place is uh, appropriate insurance because these incidents such as the fire, the um, uh, ice storm, uh, some of those situations could be covered under your insurance policy. So you wanna make sure that you meet with your insurance professional on a regular basis, at least annually, especially when it's time for renewal to make sure that you have the appropriate coverages in place as well. But um, to get back to the original question, I, I uh, suggest a six month, um, six month uh, nest egg, if you will, for businesses. And uh, it's important to have that cushion because sometimes things happen that are not gonna be covered by insurance. And uh, the, the goal of risk management is to make sure that the firm survives. So that's an excellent way to uh, set aside some funds for a small business, it, or setting aside funds for a small business is an excellent way to ensure the, the firm maintains its survival. Excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, that came in. So uh, do you have uh, any recommendations or for a type of web presence for a small business, and, and you know, extrapolate this back to you know the, the super the micro business that your 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 family was running in Pittsburgh, you know, all the way way up. Uh, do, does each business need its own website? Uh, you know, could could using the chamber or a local uh, a local conglomerate uh, and and advertising things like the Lake Erie Wine Trail or something like that, or even just using Yelp uh, is that enough? Uh, what do you recommend as far as being able to keep your uh, keep your product and keep your information viable uh, during you know, changing times or uncertain times? That's really a, it depends. It really is a business decision. Um, some businesses just don't lend themselves to uh, having a web presence. I, I know a lot of consultants out there in the insurance world that I lived in for 23 years uh, don't have a, a web presence, but they do advertise their services on LinkedIn with periodic postings. Uh, they do have a presence on uh, Facebook and et cetera. So it just depends on what, what, what your business is and what customers you want to reach. If your customers are other businesses, then um, at some point you may want to uh, uh, buy a domain name. What I suggest is no matter what, buy the domain name and, that, you're, that you think you might want to use because it will sometimes there's uh, folks out there that are gobbling up the domain names and then you have to pay them in order to have them release it to you. So if you're interested in setting up a website, I highly suggest regardless of whether or not you are um, decided or undecided, at least establish your domain name and go out and secure it as quickly as possible. And one, uh, one additional question from uh, the Facebook live stream. Um, when, when assessing your risk plan, how many different types of or different types or kinds of risk should be considered in your plan? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, really, this, this uh, 20 minute presentation is could be a four to six hour uh, a seminar. Um, but <clears throat> you want to look at uh, and identify any situations that could um, have an impact in your operations such that you would have to stop or have severely curtailed um, operations and sales. So uh, I mentioned, I went through a list of scenarios, a cyber incident, absenteeism of essential and key personnel, uh, you know, physical damage to the building, something breaks down, uh, supply chain interruptions, uh, utility outage. Those are scenarios that need to be considered. And then what you do is you list out your different, who are you gonna go to? The question is, who are you going to go to? So. Let's go to the key essential personnel or absent. Can you go to a temporary employment agency to uh, quickly secure some hands, if you will, to get involved? And the hands may not be the ones that are replacing the essential employees. Maybe there are other employees that are, that are present, who are present, who could fill in and then you backfill in with the temporary employees. You know, that's, that's something to consider. And the key to business continuity planning is when you identify these scenarios and situations and identify some key vendors who could help you that you're not currently doing business with, go visit them and set up a plan to put in place and activate should the worst case scenario occur. The last thing you wanna be doing is calling up a temporary agency when you're shut down and, with, and you've got key personnel out 
and trying to scramble the jets and figure out, okay, what kind of people do we need? You want to have all that planned out. Uh, what sort of skill set do they require? Um, so that way they can have a bank of people at the ready to call to have report to your place of business within uh, whatever your required time frame. So that's the key to all this business continuity planning is to do the work ahead of time so that should the worst case scenario occur, you blow the dust off your plan and you open up the book and you go to the particular uh, uh, pages that are um, that are applicable and just start start working the plan. So if I if I could actually jump in and speak to that, you know, I work for a, a large a large company, and within the IT space, you know, we do disaster recovery planning as well. Um, and while it, you know you could extrapolate IT as its own its own business in, in this particular case, you know, we we do all sorts of planning, and when it comes to risk and, and identifying the different sources of risk. Um, for example, you know, let's say there's a hurricane or an earthquake or, you know, something that would be very disruptive both to, um, you know, local uh, quality of life services as well as internet services. You know, we kind of all group those risks as one type of risk, right? That's going to be something that's going to involve a complete shutdown and is going to force us to look for some sort of uh, different working arrangement and different working situation. You know, then the next type of risk may be something like uh, we had a bad actor internally. So, you know, the bad actor was able to sabotage a, a, a large subset of data. Um, what do we do to recover just that data? How do we tell it was effective? So we look at that as maybe another type of risk. So, you know, while you could go and, and uh, you know, elicit a 900 different, you know, a thousand, a million different scenarios in your risk management plan, I think that, you know, from a personal experience, we look at broad types of risk. And really, when you talk about the scope and the impact, we try to group those by scope and impact. Um, you know, uh, you know, the pandemic or other types of um, uh, other types of pandemics, whether it be this one or something else. I think you know those lend itself to the same type of, of service disruptions that you'd see, the same type of provisions you would need to make to carry on and, and keep your business flowing. Um, any any thoughts or comments to any of that, or did I nail it? <laughs> you nailed it, Jeff. Um, go back into the presentation. I had the scoping process as part of the uh, planning uh, stage. And it's very important to, to scope it out. And you know, a, a major uh, event may not occur. It may not be very likely. So you have to measure, there's a process to go through and measure all that. At um, Erie Insurance, the, the largest event that we could think of that could have a negative impact on our business was um, a plane losing control and, and um, having a crash landing in the downtown area because when you think about it, the the flight pattern for planes taking off and landing at Erie Airport goes right over the downtown area. But the likelihood of that happening, very slim if zero. So we still planned what if, and we identified some situations when we first started the formal process where we needed to have uh, a, a more robust way of operating. We needed to provide remote access to certain employees who didn't have it at the time when we first started the planning process. So you'll identify gaps uh, the first few times you go through a business continuity planning uh, process, which is a good thing, that's the whole point. And then when you fill in those gaps, then you might identify, okay, it's not necessarily a gap, but we still have some concerns here that we could address. And those will, those will smooth out over time as you go through the um, updating and, and maintenance stage. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. Uh, last, last question or, or just comment for you to, to share with our audience. You know, you provided your contact information. You are but, but one man. Um, is there any resources for small businesses, um, you know, the local chamber, um, you know, the, the Erie Business Manufa or Manufacturers and Business Association, um, you know, the, the federal government that, where you could go out and find some examples and some plans and some things where, where folks may have already done this and there are, you know, some, some ready-made templates available? Yeah, there's um, the, the best site out there is from the Department of Homeland Security. They have ready.gov, ready.gov, and there's a whole host of resources out there that folks can, can visit and consider implementing or not. Um, and then I'm available to help as well if anybody wants to get into uh, a formal pro um, pro planning process. I'm sure the Manufacturers and Business Association as well as the Erie Area Chamber have some resources available as well. But it's, it's not something that, um, a small business owner may be able to take on formally himself or herself. And, you know, I'm happy to help, but there's also, there's a lot of other resources available. 
Excellent. Thank you. And Gary, we thank you for your time. That was, that was great. My um, pleasure. So, so moving on, uh, we're actually going to go to our second speaker tonight, uh, and that's going to be covering human resource preparedness, uh, Rachel Serkovniak. Rachel is the human resources consultant and trainer at the Manufacturing Business Association. And in this role, Rachel assists association member firms in all areas of human resources, including training, and this is a long list, answering HR hotline calls, recruiting, interviewing, hiring or, and orienting new employees, as well as writing and reviewing employee handbooks, HR assessments, job descriptions and compensation packages, and overseeing unemployment and benefit administration. Rachel's experience includes seven years of human resource experience uh, in both the professional and manufacturing environments. Prior to working at the MFA, she was a HR manager for the Armstrong Group of Companies uh, and Forefront Solutions overseeing two locations. Rachel has a degree from Penn State University, as well as several professional, professional licenses and certifications, including the Associate Professional in Human Resources, the Professional in Human Resources, and some sort of super designation that I think uh, it throws the S in front of that. Is that right, Rachel? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, finally, Rachel is a member of the Hum uh, Human Resources Management Association of Northwest Pennsylvania and the local chapter of the Society for Human Resources Management. So with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so that was a lot of information about me. Um, essentially, uh, I mean, I really like to piggyback on Gary's presentation because it really sets itself up for, um, you know, really where we go from here. So hopefully everybody can, can see my PowerPoint presentation. When we yep. talk about managing small businesses and crises through HR strategies, it isn't always you know, HR manager isn't always a designated HR manager. It is a office manager. It is a business owner. Um, it is anyone who handles your human resources um, procedures. Um, that includes creating your policies and procedures. Uh, when it comes to crises and, and pandemics, they're actually very crucial, especially when it came to, uh, you know, this current pandemic that we're in with coronavirus, um, the importance of developing infection control policies, um, safety procedures uh, and some PA state mandated re requirements like enforcing masks um, were absolutely critical and uh, required. Uh, so when we talk about, you know, what we're really going to go over in a, in a kind of a short amount of time, um, but essentially it is really important for small business to develop those HR tasks um, to someone in your organization. So again, that, that may be you, maybe somebody else. Um, organizations have to stay legally compliant. Uh, and mitigate li liability risk. So use those same principles that Gary talks about uh, and, and where are your gaps? Um, I talk to a, a lot of different organizations a lot, um, especially small businesses, and they really struggle with, do we really need these kind of things in place? Um, I, start, I still talk to local companies um, that don't know about Erie Band the Box. Um, and what that is, is that you can't run a, a background check um, you know, prior to offering uh, employment. That means your application should not include criminal history information on there. Um, and so how are you prepared to make sure that someone in your organization is updated on, on county policies, local policies, and, and federal? Um, sometimes when these things come out, uh, they don't come out with guidance. Um, so it's very difficult to really kind of get up there and, and, and figure these things out, especially if you're not in human resources. Um, but there are, are resources there to help you. And I always say the best human resources manager isn't necessarily somebody that's been in it for 20 years, um, but somebody who knows that things change consistently. Um, so with COVID laws, uh, we, we have seen it play a large part in small businesses. Um, there was recently enacted the FFCRA, where businesses under 500 employees were required to pick out sick pay um, in 2020. Um, so if you weren't used to FMLA policies in your organization, maybe you had only five employees, this was very different for you. Um, and now some, some companies are trying to pedal back and figure out, oh, hey, we should have paid out. Um, you know, wh what do we do in this situation? Uh, so then best practices we're going to go over is just really how to enforce those new policies with conflicting personalities. Because like any business, even small businesses, um, individuals are very different and how we manage them um, is quite different. So let's, let's first start off by squashing the myths, okay? 
Uh, any misconceptions that you have that your business is too small for policies and procedures or a handbook? Anytime a small business tells me, oh, we are too small for a handbook, I cringe a little bit. Um, as a, a nonprofit HR consulting firm, we really receive 100 calls a month. Um, and these are a lot of uh, myths that I hear. They're dry, they're unnecessary, or, or we're simply just too small. That is until there's actual problem. So unfortunately, we work with many companies after it's too late and we really have to deal with the aftermath from a lack of policies um, or lack of management. So when it comes to uh, training on these important issues, um, you know, such as how to, how to have your managers interview, you know, what things you can and cannot ask for. Um, you know, prior to this position, I worked as an HR, HR manager over two facilities in different states. And I'll tell you, you don't have time to update yourself on local laws um, when you're working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week um, and you have to keep up with different laws. Um, it's also important to understand that many laws do apply to employers with one plus employees. So that's the FSLA, the Equal Pay Act, uniform guidelines. Um, there's a lot of new laws that are introduced with COVID that all result and, and really have to be dealt with under small organizations. And you wanna avoid facing liability um, and not having anything in place. And so when we talk about crises, we, we're, we're, we're talking about things like job restructuring, modifying work schedules, um, implementing new safety requirements, so your masks. So maybe we have, um, you know, a reduction because COVID has really diminished our sales, um, or maybe the growth um, because of our sales ha have grown so much that we really need to focus on, well, how do we manage a growing uh, business? Um, so when faced with those kind of items, you really got to have fundamentally policies put in place to how you handle those situations. Um, I'll give you a really good example. Um, a very well-known company um, had a retail store that um, an employee quit after suffering harassment, um, but did not inform the company of such harassment, um, quit and then decided to sue. Um, the employer didn't have a lack of, didn't have any training or harassment policy in place. Therefore, the, the employer was liable for those. Um, the lawsuit might have been different um, if the employer had that formal policy. Um, and it's important too, if you have a formal policy, you have to follow it. Um, so it's, it's not, if it's not going to be followed, you know, don't put it in writing. Um, and sometimes even if you don't put something in writing and you have a habit of doing that, just know that does become a policy of the company. Uh, so during, you know, your, these business and changing conditions, you know, you're dealing with a lot of, a lot of updates. Um, so with, with the pandemic, we've had to designate somebody that handles who is close contact. Um, depending on what your, your field is, uh, maybe it is manufacturing and you really got to have to figure out, okay, what will happen if I have one employee over here in section A that has coronavirus and I'm going to have to shut down that line? What's my business and continuity plan? So really back to Gary's presentation on how you figure out what your risk mitigation is. Um, and then use those to your advantage through human resources. Um, does that mean going to temp agencies to get additional help during those crises? Um, does that mean uh, investing into technology to try to get more of your staff to work remotely? Um, a lot of us are working remotely. It's not easy all the time. Um, we have dogs, we have kids barking. Um, if you're manufacturing, you maybe can't. Uh, I talk with companies that do small things like uh, you know, teach people how to drive. Um, what kind of plexiglass, you know, can I install to make sure that I mitigate um, the ability for it to spread? So when we look at those, what can we do to prevent a kind of catastrophe um, from involving um, in, into our organization and how we can help? Um, and so that's where you talk about the modifying the work schedules. You know, should I spread people out? Um, how do we implement these safety requirements? Uh, and then how do we update and formalize these things um, to be put in policies um, and then really assign someone to manage those changing external factors because i will tell you it is a full-time job to keep up with the faqs from the department of labor the government um, every day they're coming out with something new um, you know lawsuits are changing the way um, certain um, laws have even originally been focused uh, and and remember to ask for help if you need it um, if you're not sure 
it is really important to you to reach out to resources, uh, you know, not even just the Manufacturing Business Association, um, but go directly to the government websites, uh, print off exactly what my organization should have to do, uh, and really try to follow up on that in order to avoid, you know, issues down the line that could really hurt your business um, long term. So where do, where do I start? You know, Gary's presentation covered it, right? You analyze your business, uh, you apply those same principles to your HR strategy. So before you can begin, you really wanna start your analysis to see what your organization is missing. Uh, if you don't have a handbook, start there. Um, are my employees working from home? If so, ask yourself, should I create a work from home policy um, that outlines required technology? And that really curbs unacceptable behavior, right? Um, do I want to have a dress code um, for when my employees are on uh, video camera? Um, it seems kind of silly um, to kind of create these policies and procedures. However, once you get into it, um, not having those policies and procedures in place have really hurt businesses, and it's really hard to come back from that. Um, so you really need to have kind of a standard of, um, hey, if, if, if you're going to be working from home, this is the type of equipment that you have to have, this is the type of internet service that you have to have, and this is the, the type of uh, business standards that, you, that you're required to have. Um, so if it's a, an office production floor, um, how do I introduce my safety requirements um, into there? Um, how do I keep workers six feet apart? You really get creative with it. Um, I know many small businesses are very livid with the restrictions. Um, you know, we talk about um, ADA, which comes in a lot. And if you're not familiar with ADA, it's really, um, you know, disability and, and there's HIPAA privacies. Um, you know, we have to work with um, individuals that, um, that have disabilities um, and how, how we bring that into an organization um, in privacy. So, you know, for example, if you have an organization that doesn't have a building that makes it available to have um, temperature screenings in person, then maybe have those uh, employees take their temperature um, before they get into the organization. Um, and then communicate. Um, and communicate when you don't know something. Um, you need to help curb that anxiety from, from your work staff. And saying that I don't know um, is, is perfectly uh, appropriate in certain situations because many people don't know and you're obviously, you're really not alone. Um, so anytime an organization, um, for example, holiday time, you get many people that say, hey, uh, you know, what if I go to California for my holiday, what, what's gonna happen? And maybe this is the first time that you dealt with it. So you're gonna say, I'm not really sure, we're gonna have to look into that. Um, but help, you know, curb that anxiety and create a plan. So you're gonna sit down with all your business leaders at that point and say, okay, looks like vacation season are coming on. You know, I really thought COVID would be done by July. Uh, it's not, it's in the heat of the heat of things. Um, you know, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna have them quarantine? Um, and how does that affect the pay policy? So according to um, Governor Wolf, um, anyone that travels in PA around July came out with the 20 states that had to quarantine, which meant any employees who did that could in fact get sick pay, um, which, you know, obviously angered a lot of employers. Um, but it did create kind of a, a, a complex in, in the organization. Did you want your employee to quarantine? Um, you know, did you need to have to pay them the extra two weeks? And so there's a lot to, um, to what different policies that you have. Um, when we talk about these things, the reason why we want to mitigate some of these policies and procedures is because there's a lot of litigation that comes involved um, with not having policies and procedures. So I gave you that great example about harassment. Um, a majority of 2019 EOC lawsuits um, came from retaliation, disability, then race, sex, age, uh, national origin, and down the list. Um, so lawsuits can damage your reputation and they can bring out old risk within any statute of limitation. Um, so do you have a harassment policy? Uh, do you have a policy on COVID? One of the things that we're kind of waiting to see how it plays out is businesses that maybe didn't follow mitigation processes. Um, how, you know, what if, you know, someone died from COVID? Will there be potential liabilities for that? Um, originally, it was thought that it wouldn't really fall under workers' comp. Uh, but maybe if you weren't following some of that mitigation, could that be on workers' comp now? Um, and as we know, OSHA um, and uh, CDC requirements are ever expanding and changing um, as we go. So again, very interested uh, for businesses right now. 
Uh, we really have to allow for flexibility though. Okay, so when I talk about policies and I talk about HR, I always get all oh, those HR people, you know, they, they just never want to ha have fun. Uh, you know, you should have your policies allow for some flexibility uh, and you don't want to commit to those policies that you, that you won't follow. Um, CDC guidelines are constantly changing. So when it comes to COVID policies, it can be an email that just kind of outlines your procedure if you travel. So this is a perfect example. We will monitor changing guidelines and adjust as necessary. Um, that policy can still be an email if you're worried about formalizing a full document. Um, you can have an internal guide to kind of address situations. Uh, when it comes to EEOC guidelines, you just need to make sure it's fair across the board. Um, so that's why really, in order to kind of mitigate any risk for lawsuits, you really have to decide pre-event uh, uh, how you're going to handle these type of situations. So a lot of times dealing with a crisis is often addressed on an emergency, employer's emergency evacuation plan as well. So maybe you already have policies and procedures that can kind of assist you in, in this situation. Um, you know, do you have a backup? Again, if, if something happens, you get a shortage of workers, um, how are you going to handle UC benefits? Another thing that came out of COVID that was a lot different um, is that PA now requires you to notify all your employees how to apply for unemployment, um, even if um, they leave on their own accord. Um, so that's, that's been a new uh, struggle for businesses um, to kind of adjust to. Do I need safety training? Um, you know, how do I put that out? Um, you know, if I didn't pay for sick pay, you know, should I consult with an attorney uh, or an HR consulting firm? Uh, don't ignore it though, um, ignoring it. Uh, again, we started seeing businesses last year, uh, started getting fined uh, locally uh, for not following some safety guidelines. Um, so we don't want you to ignore those requirements, right? We want you to kind of work with them. And what we've seen, if you do a good faith effort as a business owner, um, eventually, you know, they will make sure that uh, you're kind of taken care of and there will be less risk of, of strong hefty fines uh, for those organizations. Um, do what works best for you. When it comes to uh, adapting your current policies, seek your employee input as well. Um, your employees make up your organization. Uh, the same thing that works for one company is not going to work for another company um, depending on how your organization is set up. Um, so sometimes there's no need to start from scratch. Um, you could really get some input. Uh, don't assume though also that the way that you've always done things is the way and is the right way. Um, an example, we've had a policy, uh, we're from many companies that have policy that if your employee spouse had coverage uh, and was offered health coverage through their employer and uh, spouse's employer coverage, they were not allowed to uh, take their um, insurance. However, that is, it does not follow ACA guidelines uh, put in place by the Obama administration. So that means there's still a lot of organizations out there that maybe should get some handbook reviews and, and make sure that you're legally compliant when it comes to a lot of these things. Um, again, these could really damage your reputation, um, hundreds and thousands of dollars of fines um, for not being legally compliant. Um, and again, maybe you can't afford in your organization to hire a dedicated HR person, but it could be your HR manager, could be an office uh, assistant, uh, go get them out for training. Um, there's a lot of online programs. Um, there's a lot of you know, research that you can kind of do when it comes to these to make sure that your company is legally compliant. Um, so another big question, and again, you know, it's a shorter presentation, but the, a lot of the other questions we get is, you know, what should I do if I get an employee refusing to wear a mask? If you kind of followed our original plans and you've set up, you have work rules policy, well, it's, it's, it's a work rule, right? We're required to wear masks. Um, so you're going to refer back to your policies and procedures. Uh, you're going to follow your disciplinary procedures. Um, it's violating safety requirements. Are you going to write them up? It depends on your policy, right? Um, the state does not mandate how an employer enforces it. It only states what the employer requirements are. Um, so there's a lot of information when it comes to those kind of items. You can have those difficult employees. Maybe you have on the opposite spectrum, you have them employees that, um, you know, maybe are to the extreme about mask and, and to the opposite, you have the next employee right next to them, you know, that refuses to wear them. And how do you navigate um, you know, both of those conflicting personalities. Um, and I always 
you know, kind of stress, you really got to come from a place of understanding on both sides and find a way to kind of mitigate uh, that anxiety and stress by formalizing those policies and procedures. So get those policies and procedures in, in place, uh, communicate that to the team and say, hey, listen, you know, I know, you know, this may not be uh, make everyone 100% happy, but here, here's what we propose, here's what we're going to do. Um, and it does help mitigate that stress and probably um, help avoid some of that conflict in the workplace. Um, I, I believe you, believe me, over communicating these kind of things work a lot better than, than under communicating. And that's why I said, don't be afraid to say, hey, we're not sure, right? Because, you know, these, these are all new guidelines. Um, we've worked with companies outside of COVID uh, that, that had ran some, you know, their data. Um, so, you know, they thought about maybe we should put a policy in place that says, hey, you know, you're not allowed to open attachments to your email. And, and in theory, that, that might sound great. In practice, what it could do is slow down productivity of, of your employees. So really, in those situations, sometimes it is training, how to recognize what, what is malware, how to recognize um, you know, angry employees that might um, steal documentation. Uh, what kind of policies and procedures do you have if somebody does steal a laptop um, and doesn't doesn't bring it back? Um, you really have to think kind of worst case scenario um, and and hope for best case scenario. Um, I've been through a lot of terminations. I've been through a lot of hiring, um, and and it, nothing in life is predictable. If that. Um, so you have to be prepared um, at the highest level to make sure that you're really um, prepared as an organization and that you safeguard uh, not only your product, um, but your customer base and your reputation. Um, we've done studies that, um, that we've worked on and showed that when companies have bad reputations, they on average have to pay employees 10% more for employees on the market to really consider working at your organization. So again, it's really important to have your fundamentals in place and make sure that uh, you, you reach out for help if, if you need it. So awesome. open up for questions if anyone has it. I know um, there's a lot of different avenues when we talk about crises that they can go in any direction. Um, it doesn't have to be COVID related. Um, it could be, you know, hey, we don't have a harassment policy. You know, what do we do? How do we implement that? Thank you, Rachel. That was excellent. Uh, we do have a live question for you already. Um, so the, the question reads, during a crisis like the pandemic, do the regulations change about asking employees details around their illness if they call in sick or if they miss work? Yes, absolutely. Um, when we talk about the pandemic, um, once it was labeled as a pandemic, it gives employers a little bit more of an ability to get a little bit more deeper into, you know, what ailments they do have. However, it is still restricted to the point where it has to be COVID related questions. So I can't necessarily ask, let's say if they have breast cancer, right? Um, I have to say this, I have to look on the CDC website and I have to say, here's the symptoms related to, to COVID and here's what questions I can ask. So it is still targeted to that but it does give us the ability. And a great example of that, Jeff, is when you look at, uh, when you have customers in grocery stores, I can't ask them, right, um, for medical history if they can't wear a mask, but if it's my own employee, they have to bring me documentation that shows they do have an ailment uh, and give me information as to why they can't wear a mask. And then we can try to find some reasonable accommodation uh, within the workplace. Now, because there's not specifics on that though, I can't really give you enough legal advice on it um, because it is really dependent on the scenario. So if you're not sure, you definitely have to ask. I would say for, always proceed with caution, but stick to making sure you don't focus on a disability. You focus on really the essential functions of the job and things related to kind of COVID when it comes to these items. Excellent, thank you, Rachel. Uh, second live question that came in. Do you have any suggestions that would help promote and secure the online slash remote work environment? And to kind of piggyback on that, any suggestions to help those hesitant to have employees work remotely? Well, we get, we get that a lot. A lot of employers are hesitant. Um, and a lot of employers do have good reason to be hesitant in some cases. Uh, it's important, like I had indicated kind of in the presentation, to have a policy in place um, to make sure it's not an open-ended, you can stay home forever. Um, you need to make sure you have a policy that says, hey, um, you know, we offer, we allow you to work from home as long as the quality is there. 
Um, and so you set up those standards, like if you're going to be leaving your workstation, right, your policies and procedures still apply. So you got to notify me if you're not going to be um, at your computer at your designated time. And so those are the things you have to set up. I will say, generally, though, the productivity for those that work from home, they tend to be more productive because they don't have that office banter back and forth um, and they tend to work later hours. Um, again, it might be different though um, with different people. So you still have to mitigate the risk between what kind of population that you have when it comes to your organization. So if you have a type A personality that really likes to talk and integrate, they're gonna struggle uh, working from home. I know me personally, when I started working from home uh, more, uh, I missed that interaction. Uh, so we really, need to make sure that employers still have that um, that one-on-one -on -one conversation, those hands-on meetings with those folks, and then how to set up from, you know, the IT side of things on how you're going to handle um, breaches now that, that might be outside uh, your organization and making sure that there's no safety risks that are posed um, from other people's Wi-Fi. So there's a whole lot to look into before you should jump to remote. Um, but I will say, I think the benefits outweigh uh, the negatives as long as you're set up ahead of time. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Excellent. Um, so, Rachel, we do have a third live question from Facebook for you. However, uh, I see Gary reappeared, and I, I think he'd like to, uh, to chime in on this one as well. Gary? Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, great points, Rachel. One of the things that uh, you want to make sure that you do when you're setting up a work-from-home environment is to get appropriate IT steps in place. One of the things that uh, a lot of uh, good cyber practice uh, firms are using is uh, dual authentication. So you log into the company system, but there's another uh, uh, app or uh, text message that goes to the employee's phone or to their um, uh, another app that's opened up on uh, their personal computer or an iPad that uh, Verifies their authentic, verifies their identity. So there's a lot of other IT steps that Rachel touched on that should be implemented to ensure that the work from home workforce has access to what they need, but doesn't create additional exposures to the organization. Yeah, I think that the the industry buzzword there is MFA or multi-factor authentication. Um, and there are a number of providers, depending on where your IT service is, uh, whether they be internal or whether they're hosted, um, you know, can, can, you can walk through and set some of those up. So yes, thank you, Gary. Absolutely. Appreciate yep. that. Uh, Rachel, back to you for question number three. Um, what is the best way an employee can approach their employer to maybe suggest that some policies, procedures, or handbooks, you know, should be updated and, and would maybe, um, you know, enhance the, uh, the workplace somewhat? Well, I, I, I actually get this question a lot because I can, you know, I'm a part-time HR consultant and I encourage um, folks to come to me and try to, my, my job is essentially to bridge the gap between employees and employers. And so this is what I always try to get um, companies to see is, you know, you have to kind of put yourself in other shoes and sometimes honesty is the best policy. Um, and so really going to them on a one-on-one -on -one and not in a threatening way and just say, hey, listen, um, if you're, depending on your position too, if, I, if I'm a manager, I'm going to say, hey, I got a lot of my team members right now that are, that are, have high anxiety about, you know, so-and-so going on vacation. We really got to formulize some plan. Um, you know, what are, what are we going to do? Have we thought about this kind of thing? And sometimes that's the easiest way is to uh, approach it. Um, let's just say worst case scenario, um, you know, they don't really want to deal with this member. They're, you know, kind of against, you know, these new regulations that are coming in. You, you kind of really have to, you know, make it, you know, know that, hey, this is really important to me. Um, and if you're, you know, you're a good employee um, and, you know, they're going to, they're going to want to make sure that you're happy and content. And so sometimes the hardest battle is opening that conversation up and letting them know, hey, I, I think it's time for this kind of policy. Um, that we need to put in place so that we can mitigate the risk. And I will tell you, money talks over anything. Um, so a lot of times you can bring, I will tell you, um, I'll give you a great example. We have companies that do not train their managers enough. Um, and so they say illegal things all the time. One great example is, I'm sure everyone watches Shark Tank here. You got Barbara Cockerton, a very well-known billionaire. Um, 
and she made a comment when it came to how she interviews and how she always asks about their family status. Well, I'm sure all HR managers and lawyers had a heart attack. They're like, oh my God, you can't say that because um, you're not legally allowed to ask those kind of questions, right? Um, so sometimes, um, when it comes to those kind of things, you really have to say, hey, you know, you just opened up, us up, you know, for kind of liability. Here's some example lawsuits. And, and that's kind of why in the beginning slides, I really wanted to show the type of lawsuits that come out from failure to kind of act ahead of time, um, because that, that usually sets an organization up. Uh, if you're getting a lot of turnover in which we've seen companies, if they don't feel you're doing enough um, COVID regulations, they are leaving and to go to different organizations. And remember, unemployment is higher sometimes in most cases. So people are making more money in unemployment. So you really want to bring that up and, and you want to talk about that, but you want to try to do it um, and not in a negative way. Not that, hey, you're not doing enough, right? Um, hey, here's some of these lawsuits that I've seen. You can Google even local lawsuits in the area um, that have come up. Um, and hopefully, um, like I said, money usually tends to talk. Um, and then you can kind of open up a, a good conversation as long as it's not coming from a place of an attack uh, and more of a mutual, hey, you know, hey, I'm, I, I love to work for you. I think our business is great. Um, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we are setting the organization up for, um, you know, for the best success. And that tends to have a positive outcome. And, and to your point, Rachel, there is a, a really good chance that if the, the, the manager or the or the the boss, so to speak, didn't have time, and you know one employee really did show some interest in you know updating those policies and procedures. You know maybe they were just volunteered for a new you know a, a new responsibility, or you know if they yeah. would like to take that on, um, you know that's certainly an option, depending on how small the organization is or how large even, and and how that that kind of reporting structure is is truly structured. Uh, to your point, anyone can help maintain these things. Uh, they don't have to be in an official. Um, hiring and firing position, so to speak, yes. to help maintain policies and update it and bring those things into uh, into compliance. Yeah, your HR managers are whoever in your organization is handling any of these items. So that's why in small businesses, HR managers are still your office assistants. Um, so don't be afraid to bring in these things and don't be afraid to ask for training um, or, or look at research. I mean, the MBA offers a lot of training classes to our members that come in for entry level HR. Um, but there's, there's a lot of series that you can take online. And like I said, me as an HR manager over two facilities, there were still things that I did not know. I mean, me in my position now, it's a full-time job just updating, uh, you know, policies and procedures and, and laws that come out. So, you know, it's okay to not know everything. And that's why we say, I'm not sure. Um, my go-to answer is, I'm not sure I'll check on that, but that's a really good question. And we'll get back to you and we'll figure this out um, and make sure we update our kind of our policies and procedures. None of the businesses that I worked for uh, purposely have done anything illegal. And in most cases do not tend to discriminate against others. They just inadvertently um, don't take the time um, because it gets, you know, it's, it's tough running your own business. There's a lot of work involved. Um, so it, it, it is very difficult and sometimes tasking somebody else within the organization to help you out or a group of people uh, can really help you. Even somebody just to follow up on CDC guidelines, you know, we know that the date of exposure, um, first it was four hours and then it was, you know, 15 minutes. Now they're, you know, 10 minutes and that quarantine period is, you know, was 14 days and now it can go down to 10. So there's a lot of those moving pieces that come in just like any loss. So great, thank you, Rachel. Um, this is a, a perfect last question to to end your 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 um, your excellent time with us here um, from from Facebook Live. Uh, do you have to be a member of the Manufacturers and Business Association to utilize the legal and HR services? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, to use our legal uh, and HR consulting, you would. I will say we're we're a nonprofit. It is very um, uh, cheap and inexpensive. Uh, and I will tell you, a lot of our members are, are greatly appreciative. However, um, you know, depending on what it is, we always feel free to reach out and, and come talk to us if you feel, um, you know, we might be able to help you in, in different ways. We do have non-member pricing for certain webinars, and sometimes we hold free webinars. So we did a handbook essentials class that was open up to everybody. Um, so there are things that we do for free as well um, that are for non-members as well. Um, so there are things that are out there that can assist. Uh, you with that. So follow us on like our LinkedIn page, uh, our Facebook, and, and you'll get a lot of those free offerings. Excellent. What a great resource for the, uh, for the Erie area. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so uh, that's going to conclude our, our question and answer. Gary, I see you jumping back on with video. Do you 
have some? Nope, just, just nope. saying goodbye. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to wrap up now. So uh, the 2020 cohort and the Jefferson Civic Leadership Society would like to thank our speakers tonight, Gary and Rachel. Uh, an additional thank you to the Erie Manufacturers and Business Association for providing uh, Rachel uh, with us here tonight. The 2020 cohort would also like to thank all of our other speakers in this series, uh, the Jefferson Society Leadership Team for guiding us along, and anyone else who was able to make this series possible. The 2020 cohort would like to remind our participants that additional information is available from our, our other three sessions, which can be found on the Jefferson Society Facebook page. Links are now, uh, should be on your screen. And, uh, and please feel free to visit the uh, Jefferson Society uh, page on Facebook. Um, last, if you, uh, if you remember, please uh, go to visit the survey link shown on the screen or in the Facebook live chat and leave us some feedback and suggestions if this is something you'd like to see uh, carried on or if there's things we can do better. Uh, certainly our, we're, we're doing this here for you. So again, thank you and have a great evening. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you guys, have a great day. Thanks.